Okay, I invite everybody to close your eyes and take a nice big deep breath and let it all go. I am here only to be truly helpful. I am here to represent him who sent me. I do not have to worry about what to say or what to do because he who sent me will, be, will direct me. I am content to be wherever he wishes, knowing he goes there with me. I will be healed as I let him teach me to heal. Amen. Alrighty, so we are going to move in a different direction. And as most of you know, in a couple of weeks, it will be Easter. And we also know that in some traditions, the, the preparation for Easter has already begun. So we are going to talk about, in the next number of weeks, around the ideas of how the Course differs, I guess you could say, from conventional Christianity. And this is not meant as an attack on Christianity or putting down of any religions or spiritualities. It's more of an education of understanding the perspective of the Course in regard to what the message that Jesus had to give. So I don't know if everybody got it because I was having trouble with my email last night, but I did attach a definition list that if you did not get one, if you could send me an email, I will send one out to you. And as we go along in the next couple of weeks, we are going to be addressing some of these definitions. So I thought it would be helpful if you actually have them in front of you. So if you did get it or do get it, you make a copy and have it in your book so you can follow along. Because personally, when I can see it and hear it, it makes more sense, it goes in deeper. So that's just my learning experience. So I thought we'd start with the definition and these all these definitions come from the glossary index from A Course in Miracles by Ken Wapnick, who was my basic teacher. So the definition of Easter according to the Course is a holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus. Since the resurrection symbolizes ego transcendence in its overcoming of death, Easter is used as a symbol for the Son of God's offering and the acceptance of redemption or ego transcendence through forgiveness. So I'm going to go through that, kind of chopping it up a little bit at a time to really emphasize what it means. So Easter is the holiday comm commemorating the resurrection of Jesus. And those of you who are familiar with Christianity probably are aware that a great deal of the Easter story was focused on Jesus' death you know, the, the stations of the cross, the preparation, sa sacrifice, and so on, to basically show God that you love him, you're sacrificing, and so on. But the Course turns that around completely and says that the holiday, it's a holiday commemorating the resurrection of Jesus. And the reason why that is, is because the concept of crucifixion of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins means something very different from the perspective of the Course, and that is that it was really a message in showing us that no matter what happened to the body, that if you're aligned with truth, that you won't be affected by that experience. And in the Course, Jesus actually talks about the idea, and we'll go into some of these um, sections a little bit more in detail that, you know, we all feel like we are innocent victims of circumstances beyond our control. But in his message, you know, some of the most horrible experiences took place. But because he was aligned with his right mind, he was not affected no matter what happened to his body. So again, the, the whole focus is on the resurrection 
through forgiveness instead of spending all the time on the crucifixion and how horrible it was and how he was an innocent victim and so and so. So since the resurrection symbolizes ego transcendence, it is the overcoming of death. So according to the Course, when we had the tiny mad idea and we chose to separate, we then believed in the concept of death. Before that, there was only eternity. So when it says the resurrection symbolizes ego's transcendence, we transcend from the belief of the ego, which believes in birth and death, and we now live in the understanding that there was really never was any death and that we are still a part of eternity. Easter is used as a symbol for the Son of God's offering and acceptance of redemption or ego transcendence through forgiveness. And the way the Course um, offers this is, is that we become aware, you know, from using this chart, we were all at one in God. We had the tiny mad idea of, I wonder what it would be like if I separated from God. And we got to be what the only thing that God did not offer us, let me just get this chart here, is when we were in oneness, all the gifts that God had were freely given to us. The only thing that was not given to us was that we were the creator. And we wanted to see what it would be like if we were the creator. So at that moment, we chose to separate. And then we took on an identity, the total opposite of what God was. But we're on the throne, we're now the creator. And as a result of that, we had guilt, sin, and fear, death, projection, and we're different. And there's a me, and there's a God, and then there's a me, and then my brothers. And so when we did that, we were here. We now experience the total opposite of everything that we had experienced when we were at one, which was suddenly, instead of light, darkness, guilt, sin, and fear, instead of love, peace, and joy, um, the belief in duality, where there's one against the other, or kill or be killed, and the belief in separation, which was not a very comfortable experience after having lived in an experience of, would be very similar to, you know, living in the womb of a mother and then suddenly being, you know, thrust out into this terrifying experience. And we couldn't tolerate the guilt, sin, and fear that was in our mind. So we were afraid to go back to oneness. So what we did is we projected into the world, taking all our guilt, sin, and fear and dumping it into something or someone outside of ourselves so that we could play the part of an innocent victim and always perpetually blame or believe that something outside of me is where the problem lies. And of course, every time we took a step, we forgot the step before that. When we were over here, we projected into the world, and then we forgot that this was here either. So we were literally born the moment our first breath in a world where I literally believe I'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control, even to the concept of my birth. I didn't ask to be born, here I am, I'm stuck, I guess I gotta make the best I can within the context of where I find myself. And what the Course is trying to help us understand is, well, yep, that's where you seem to have found yourself, but this is a result of this choice. And there is another choice in your mind when you're ready to choose for it. And when it talks about the idea of redemption or ego transcendence through forgiveness, the forgiveness is basically realizing that what we thought we did by projecting into the world and having this silly idea where we thought we were different than God is not true. And so we forgive ourselves for the belief that we had, and then we find ourselves back here, which is exactly what the crucifixion in the Course is trying to explain about Jesus. He literally remembered who he was and nothing that any that anyone did or said or how they acted towards him as a body had any effect on him. And we have our little Jesus chart. Okay, so basically what this represents is if you're identified with the ego side of the 
crucifixion or the world, you're going to see Jesus through the lens of he was crucified, his body died, you know, it really happened. It was because people were, were bad, he was innocent, but they had to kill him off because he didn't fit in. And there was a lot of pain, there was attack, and th that Jesus was different than we are. He was the good son, and this all happened to him. And if we begin to identify with our true self, we will see the crucifixion through the lens of, it was really a story of resurrection and transcendence. It was to bring us back to eternal life. Um, this is in the mind, this is in the body, and nothing really happened. We're back at home in love, as we always were. We align back with truth, spirit, love, and we're the same, and we're ultimately innocent versus an innocent victim. Now, before I go on, does anybody have any questions? Because that's a lot that I spewed out there. And for Annie especially, I know this is pretty overwhelming. I'm <laughs> But hang in there. We, we keep hashing it over every week. So um, eventually it starts to make sense a bit more. Anybody have anything? Nope, they're speechless, man. Okay, so anyways, basically what it was, it's telling us is that instead of the focal point of Jesus dying on the cross and poor Jesus, the poor little innocent victim and, and that whole storyline, the real purpose, again, according to the Course, is that Jesus aligned totally with his right mind and nothing that happened on the outside affected that peace because he was totally aligned with that peace. Versus any one of us who, if we were being put on the cross, had our name, you know, spit on our clothes taken away and the whole shebang that he went through, we would probably see it very much through this lens instead of through this lens. Well, Marianne. Yes. I'm sorry I missed the cue before no. uh, <laughs> to <take laughs> ask questions. Um, so the, just the experience that you're looking at with the two sides of that, of your chart there with Jesus on the cross and then being resurrected is a, like it's a, it's a division or it's a, a separation of what we all have is we have our, the side that is the body and the side that wants to be, wants to know what, what else there is. So, so it's like there's, the 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 basic uh, problem is set up by uh, in each of us the same way we in each of us we have this body that's subject to um uh you know the, the things of the world and pain and 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 all that stuff and sin and then there's the part that's um where we can come through and through the re the resurrection as well so it's like that's Correct. That's a that's a separate that's 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 a separation of between our um, between the ego and, and our and, and the Holy Spirit. Correct. Yes. yes. And and the course would say Jesus was the way shower and what he was trying to show us, unlike the conventional Christian way of looking at it, was I didn't you know die for your sins and all that and I didn't suffer and was in pain and all that like the story went I came to show you that I was able to do this and I want to show you that you too can do this if but you Jesus go through was... the process of forgiveness if you're if you're going to play the part of an innocent victim you're not going to get this you'll stay over here right so Marianne and, yes, the, yes Jesus had no grievances whatsoever Perfect. Right. Yes. If correct. we have grievances, we're going to stay on the left side of the chart. Absolutely correct. And actually, you were just leading me in here because <laughs> I was going to say, you know, if we we go back in history, let's say it's over two thousand years ago, we're there observing the experience, and you know, I'm sure there were they they claimed that there were people that were yelling crucify him, crucify him. And then, of course, there were some in the crowd that would say, no, don't do it, don't do it. And, you know, if you wonder which part would I be playing in that scenario, the answer is 
just like you just got done saying, Jason, if I have no grievances anymore, I would be saying, no, don't do it. But if I have any grievances on some level, I would be saying, crucify them. And that's literally what we're doing on a daily basis when we enact with people in our lives where we want to crucify them because we feel I'm an innocent victim due to circumstances that you have presented. And if I just get rid of you, I'll be okay. And the course mm -hmm. is saying, one time, the course is saying, if I identify and live in the belief system of separation, it has nothing to do with my brother or what he does or doesn't do to me. It has to do with the fact that this is what's the part of the mind that is engaged at that time. And again, as Jesus finally totally transcended this mind and totally aligned with this mind, nothing that happened in the world would affect him because he would see his brother as being the same instead of different. Yes, go ahead. If I had no grievances, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it, it wouldn't matter, right? I wouldn't be on either side. I wouldn't say crucify him, don't crucify him. Well, I, I mean, I would I be seeing this as all as a dream. Well, so. you would be seeing it all as, an, as an, a dream, but internally, if you only are love, you could only express love. Now, you would not judge the person who was saying crucify them because you would know they were exactly where they needed to be, but it wouldn't affect the connection with truth that you have. Yeah. Sound good? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that the for and against is just is duality. Well, exactly. Okay. I see your point there. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yes, definitely. Definitely. And so the point is, you know, let's say this is Jesus, and we might say, let's put it back up here, that Jesus is over here, okay, which in truth, Jesus is over here. But if I'm looking through grievances, I'm literally putting Jesus over here as well as myself and my brother, because however I see myself, my brother, or Jesus, or God for that matter, is going to be how it gets played out in my life experiences. I will look at Jesus on the cross, I will see pain and suffering. When we totally align with what truth is, we will only see through the eyes of absolute love. The, the, the grievance part of it would be completely gone. And I don't know exactly what part of the conversation came up, but um, what was I going to say about grievances? Hmm. <laughs> I guess nothing because it's gone away. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back later. All right. So anyways, again, it depends on, you know, the same scenario happened. Jesus died on the cross. It was, you know, horrendous experience. That's a given. But Jesus literally came to a place where he lived it through his right mind. So none of that affected him whatsoever. Okay. But we, but we don't do that. We look at it as, you know, no, no, we, no. I mean, that's where I don't say that we don't do that, but, but coming from a, a situation where we think that it's an awful thing and we've already judged how that has influenced the rest of the spirituality that we have. Whereas um, the, the situation was set up for us to, not bring duality to it, but to see the progression from our own thought of of the crucifixion to the resurrection. That that's the whole point. It wasn't what happened to Jesus's body, right? But how he transcended it, and then that's um, rather than us feeling guilty about what happened to his body. Um, when we go to the Holy Spirit with it, the answer comes that nothing really happened and that this is okay. the way the world works is it looks like complete hell, but it's about the choice we make to decide if we're going to be one with the Holy Spirit or if we're going to look at 
look at what we think we're looking at and think that's the whole story. Right. right, Andrea. I think there are two things here. One is the way Jesus perceived himself, and the other one is the model that he gave us to perceive ourselves. Okay. Uh -huh. And why do you think those are different, Jason? Well, I think they're the same, but, but Jesus was fully aligned with the right okay. mind. Okay, all right. So yeah. we're not fully aligned with the right mind, but he gave us a model to follow. Oh, okay. That we could. Yeah. Yes. If we let yes. go of our grievances, we could be aligned with the right mind. Correct, correct. And, and, and that's, really the, that's really the progression that we can follow to reach a level of, of spiritual, uh, we can reach the other side. That's, that's a, the, the, it was like a, as a model, you take the steps of choosing, um, and then, and then you experience that. Otherwise, you see it as two different things, as two, um, you know, that what he, what he did was all messed up. And that, so, so then he just happened to uh, um, resurrect or something like that, that he was better than his. It was just the way he did it, the way what he got to experience was a resurrection. And it was all our fault. That, but you know, it's the we same so model. It's the same model that he followed, that he's giving us to follow. That's why yeah. he, you know, he turned us yeah. over to the Holy Spirit in the Bible. He talks about, you know, the Holy Spirit will guide you, you know, going forward. Yes, right. yes, yes. And it, if you don't see it as a model, then you see it as a, a problem. I guess that's, you know, if, if you don't see it as a model, you, you like, I, I think we, we've had to change the way we see it to be able to incorporate uh, um, you know, who Jesus really was in, in our, in our world or in our life, rather than, you know, that poor schmuck that got hung, got hung up on the cross and then said, oh yeah, well, ho-hum, by the way, I resurrected. Um, anyway, I, I don't know, maybe I've gotten myself in too, too deep. <laughs> that wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, because because the model, I mean, I grew up with that model of the person on the cross and then the idea of resurrection. And you're like, well, go figure, you know, why did he even bother to do all that? You know, if, if you're not using the Holy Spirit, you don't get it. Right. Or you feel sorry for him. Yes. And, and what I was going to say before was when we can come to a place where we understand that the, the dream of the illusion is nothing. It's just a dream. It would be very much like going to a theater, watching a movie or a play. You know that nothing that happens in that play is real. But in our play, we think everything is very real and we're affected by all the things that occur in our experience. And yet, Jesus is saying, when you really completely align with your right mind, you will see the world as it is without judgment, but it won't come in and affect you in any way because you have aligned your mind completely with the peace. And the way that occurs, as Jason mentioned, is when we no longer have grievances and grievances live over here, they don't live over here. I can't bring my grievances over here and be grievanceless. Grievanceless. That's a hard Good one. <laughs> yeah. So Say it three times to, fast. Yeah, right. I have to drop <laughs> my connection with my grievances to be shown who I really am and who my brother really is. So there's a um, an anecdote that comes to mind for me as we're discussing this. I think there's even one step prior to this, which is, I know for me, I didn't have the discernment of there's this life and there's something bigger going on. I didn't have the, the, the understanding of sort of, right. <clears throat> I guess it's a different kind of duality uh, in that there's the, well, I don't know if you'd call it duality. I didn't have the discernment that there was the dream and then the spiritual reality, right? I didn't have an understanding that there were two different things, right? Right. And so I think for me, my journey with a lot of this material has been more and more understanding that um, when I'm on the, what, what for me is the right side of that diagram, the true self side, right. then I can kind of see that there is something else, that ego self. And the more that I can tease those apart, the like, 
easier it is to spend more time on the true self side. And the anecdote that comes to mind is when they showed, I've heard that when they showed the first moving pictures, like way at the beginning of the 20th century, I think in, in, in France maybe, anyway, they showed pictures of a train coming toward the audience and the audience couldn't discern that this was an image. They thought it was really happening and people fled the theater in terror because they thought it was so real. Now, of course, we know differently, right? We know that it's it's a picture on a screen, the projection. Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, that yeah. anecdote is sort of like, represents my experience of like, you have to know that it's a, it's it's, it's something else. You have to know that it's a dream. You have to know that it's a moving picture. It's not the real train. It's the ego self. It's not the real self. Um, and so having that, just being able to pull those two things apart has been the source of a great deal of um, like growth for me. And you mentioned that was your progress. I would say that's true for all of us. Most of us aren't aware that literally if I'm, you know, not here, I'm here and I'm here most of the time because you know, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like this is my home. And in, until something really major occurs that really upsets me or irritates me, then I might ask for help. But literally, everything that's going on in the dualistic world is representative of this thought system. And as you say, you start to understand it, and then you can pick and pull and, and get a hold of how frequently we are really identifying with the ego which then will allow us an opportunity to drop it into to connect with what is true if i don't know it's broken i can't fix it Tonight. yeah and i think that that to jason's point um one of the things that i really like about the course so far is what a mm -hmm. rigorous and supportive framework it gives us for thinking about these i think that's one of the things you were your point the point that you were making jason is this is a framework for us to kind of a mental model to work with the, these I, these issues yes and the course would even say or you know ken would often say you know we just thought this is all i had to choose from you know i'm an innocent victim of circumstances beyond my control so the course is now revealing what caused this to appear the way it does so that i understand i'm not an innocent victim of this i am a, i guess you could say um i am affected because of the choice the son of god made and beyond that, there's an answer that I can choose that offers me a totally, totally different experience. But before, you know, this is all I had to work with. You know, manipulate, try to figure it out, do it on my own, and the answer doesn't live on this side of the chart. And but so, you know, we, Mary, we, and when, yes. when we have when we have a grievance, we have to basically own that and say that we created that and we wanted that, right? Absolutely, yes. Which is something most of us, number one, especially initially, don't want to admit. You know, I mean, it's not even that we don't want to admit. We almost can't even wrap our head around the concept of I have to understand that and admit that. But as you keep understanding deeper and deeper, you start to realize, well, I mean, think about this. If I was at peace, nothing would disturb me. If something can disturb me, it has to mean I've chosen against that. End of story. And if you start to filter through that kind of a lens, well, who's got the problem? God? No way. Marianne, or the, the result of Marianne of the Son of God who has chosen separation. Marianne. Now, now I've got something to work with. Before, there was, there was no choice. I'm an innocent victim. Yes, go ahead. I, I just wanted Cynthia to thank you so much for that visual with the train. It yeah. reminds me of a true story of my uh, great grandfather. When they got radio for the first time, reportedly, he could not fathom where the little man was that was speaking through the radio, had no perception or frame of reference to understand that there was not a little man inside that radio. And it makes me think of the course where it, we all have a perceptual problem, not problem, but yeah, problem. And, 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 and that visual was just so helpful. So thank you for that. Yes, yes. And actually throughout the course, there are numerous references to the idea that 
there are things we simply won't be able to understand when we first start reading the course. Our, our, our lens or our ability is so limited that it, it's impossible. But as you keep practicing, you know, learning, taking it in, reading, whatever, coming to class, slowly all those little, you know, all those little dots start to connect. And then you might hear something that you've heard a thousand times before. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's what he means by that. But it comes as a result of your desire to understand and move beyond where we are. Well, I was just thinking of how the, that, that we are, uh, I have been steeped in the lesson of the crucifixion in terms of my own life. I think that I, that people are taught that they know and that they expect a crucifixion to be mean that they die because that's kind of the story. That's the ego story about, you know, you, you suffer, then you die. And, and so that's been the story that, um, I've either been, um, I've been, or I've known and, and been afraid of, and I, people or situations have tried to protect me from that story. Mm -hmm. And that's been like the story of my life. If I know I'm gonna, I know I'm gonna die someday. And it's probably gonna be bad, probably not this cr crucifixion, but, and then living your life, um, going through problems that are insurmountable are absolutely worse than any crucifixion I could imagine for three hours is, you know, days and days of wondering things or, you know, of being subjected to things that I felt were uh, painful. And then to have um, the other part of the world try to protect me from those things is exactly really the same thing, only an opposite um, opinion. So, so the, so the body, it's all about the body and how you keep away from those things that happen to the body. And there's never a mention of the resurrection because they don't know, they don't know how it worked and they thought it was just Jesus who could do that. Correct. Correct. Which again, leading right into my next thing is a definition from Jesus. And we, you know, again, from the Christian point of view, the idea of Jesus being very special. He was the only son of God that could do this. And he was very, very, you know, the image of him being very, very special is huge. And I think even in our way of looking at Jesus, usually he's on a pedestal. And really, from the perspective of the Course of Miracles, it doesn't matter if you're looking down on someone or looking up on someone. It's the same. We're different. We're not the same. And Jesus is trying to help us understand that, no, we are the same. And this is a little quote that, that's on page, uh, text, page seven. Paragraph three, line five, if anybody wants, to, I'm just going to read a little bit, but if anybody wants to look it up. All right, so this is Jesus telling us how he's not special. He said, equals should not be in awe of one another because awe implies unequality. It is therefore inappropriate reaction to me. An elder brother is entailed, or excuse me, entitled to respect for his greater experience and obedience for his greater wisdom. He is also entitled to love because he is a brother and to devotion if he is devoted. It is only my devotion that it entails me to yours. There is nothing about me that you cannot attain. I have nothing that does not come from God. The difference between us now is that I have nothing else. This leaves me in a state which is, not, which is only potential to you. So Jesus is trying to explain to us, just like if you were in kindergarten and your elder brother was in high school, obviously he's got more knowledge, he's got more information, he's you know, lived that many years of his life, and he could guide us and lead us and help us. But in potential, we're identical. There's nothing that we could not accomplish that Jesus was able to accomplish. And I think that kind of puts us all into a very different perspective than this guy up on a pedestal that there's no way I'm ever gonna reach that pedestal where he's you know, specifically stating on page seven in the text, 
we're the same. I just know a little bit more. And if you listen to my words, to my guidance, I'll show you how to get from, you know, crucifixion to res resurrection and show you that you are just as capable of this as I was. All right. All right. So there's just a real quick line that says about crucifixion versus atonement from the perspective of the Course. The crucifixion did not establish the atonement, the resurrection did. So again, this is sort of like flipping the whole story around when we're looking at it through the lens of the Course. It's about recognizing that all of us can make it to the resurrection if we continue to drop our investment in what the ego side of our mind entails and continue to ask to see who you really are. All right, now another word that gets tossed around a great deal in relationship to Easter is the word sacrifice. And here's a little quote about that. Sacrifice is a notion totally unknown to God. It arises solely from fear and frightened people can be vicious. Sacrificing in any way is a violation of my injunction that you should be merciful even as your Father in heaven is merciful. It has been hard for many Christians to realize that this applies to themselves. So again, this idea, if you're doing anything from the Course or anything else in your life for that matter, from a place of I'm going to sacrifice something I want so that somebody else can have it, you're coming from the ego instead of the win-win um, scenario when you choose to connect with the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> I think it's hard for most of us to even you know, slip out of the idea of sacrifice because it's such a big, huge part of who, who we are on planet Earth. And yeah, but don't we, don't we, we, we all, then we suffer accordingly. Well, we we suffer we, from that. We well, suffer yeah. from that idea. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, and we, we suffer from that because we're looking for something to be, be recalled or to be gained from, from that. And, and yes. that's, yes. when that doesn't happen, the sacrifice doesn't, isn't registered uh, on the, you know, on the Holy Spirit's Richter scale, mm -hmm. then we're, then we, then we suffer. Because we don't, we don't, we, we're looking for tit for tat, but we're, we're, right. we're ignoring the Holy Spirit. Yes. And it's usually some kind of a bargaining tactic. Bargaining. I'm going to give to you a little bit of something. So you'll give to me a lot of something that I like in return. And that's not love. Love is total unconditional love where there is no expectation about receiving something other than that. Now, when we're really connected with the real love, you'll then get everything because love is the summation of everything and no longer the limitedness that we cling to and hold on to. So, Marianne, uh, if, if we look at uh, sacrifice yes. a little bit and, you know, if you're on a diet, you're, you're, you're eliminating certain foods because right. you know that you should, you, you, you will benefit from that. Right. That's not really sacrifice, is it? <sighs> okay. <laughs> well, this, it this depends is, on if you suffer, right? <laughs> right. You know, again, that's a tricky scenario because, you know, ultimately, if you understand you don't have a body unequivocally, then you really wouldn't be that concerned about what happens to the body. But we're not there, so we're going to continue to play games of sacrifice. And if your desire to lose weight is important to you, you would, you know, then look through that perimeter of, okay, if I cut down my calories and exercise more, that the result will be a more comfortable result for me. So again, understand that's because you're still playing within the arena of the ego. And you can't pretend you're not done with the body identification. But in an ultimate sense, what's the difference what my body looks like? Understand, I'm not there, so I'm not, not, not pointing fingers at anybody. But we have to take ourselves exactly where we are. Well, but it would be you nice could that, if, You could do that same thing. I think, for me, I think about it in terms of intention, right? If you're going on a diet because you want to 
be healthy and be the best person you can or right. whatever. And that it's, it's like a choice. It's like owning, um, it's like owning our sins and our, our like that nobody victimized. Like if we're going to own that of, you know, I'm not an innocent victim. I chose these things when I made those decisions along the way. That's one way of saying like, it's, it's more of a proactive choice. And I think with a diet, just for this example, you can either, it's the same thing. You can either come from, you know, this, I'm managing my body. I have to sacrifice. I have to do this. Or you can come from, I'm making a choice, like owning the choice of doing something positive in the same way that we own the choice of, well, the situation is in my life because I created it or something. Right. So I think to me, there's a little bit of a difference there. One is you're choosing for something freely and, and choosing it, choosing something that feels good. The other one is actually sacrificing. You could do the same exact actions, but the frame of reference can be very different, I think. Well, definitely that's true. And, and be very aware that as the choice for separation, I have to find something that I'm an innocent victim of. And certainly my body gaining weight is, is a cause for me to be an innocent victim. And I want to be, an, I, I, not, not that I want to be an innocent victim, but the way this is set up, it requires that I, in order for me to be an innocent victim, there has to be some form of a perpetrator. So in our normal way of looking at things, we're always looking at what do I do to fix the perpetrator? We seldom ever yeah. go to, wait a minute, where's the real problem? The real problem is I need to be an innocent victim and I have to have a perpetrator. So, you know, again, not that you shouldn't make those choices and shouldn't take care of yourself and, and all those kinds of things. And certainly seeing that in a little different perspective, as Cynthia was talking about, can put you in a, in a more powerful position. But we seldom immediately go to, okay, I, I've lost my peace again. How can I rectify that by lining up and choosing to connect with the Holy Spirit? And I know I've given this example, but since there's a couple new people, if you think about your roof leaking and it's pouring down in your kitchen floor, well, you're going to go to the store and you're going to buy a mop and you're going to clean that floor because if you don't, someone could trip and fall. But the problem isn't the water on the floor. The problem is the leak in the ceiling. And I can mop forever but until I get up on the roof and start fixing the roof, the problem is going to just continue to happen. And I'm gonna to continue to clean up thinking I'm accomplishing something. And what I'm saying is definitely keep mopping the floor. And every time you put a new, um, whatever those things are on your roof, somebody help me out, it's good with that. Um, you know, every time you put another nail and, and, and fix one more thing of the, of the roof, you're healing what the real problem is. So again, we got to take ourselves where we are and maybe that's taking, doing the diet and looking at the lens through, you know, however I can make that work for me. But understand I'm an innocent victim and I need to align with the Holy Spirit and be shown who I really am. That it's, then, it's, it's really hard to get, it's really hard to get to the easy easier thing to do but to just think about over the years of you know well you know years before this doing diets or thinking i better lose this weight or i mean i've lost the same 20 pounds you know maybe 10 times so it just comes off and goes on or whatever but when um i started to ask the holy spirit what to do because i was hungry um you know somehow to get in with that crowd is to uh and then so then the chocolate eliminated itself because okay, right. i wasn't addressing it anymore i was addressing i was wanted to play with the holy spirit instead of more diet books or more you know and and so to see that to find that 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 and and, and to realize that like chocolate or anything that seems you know bad for you or you can judge about it's all the same thing is is really interesting because then that's when you start to get to the heart of the matter that, you know, you're all wrapped up in these things. And instead of having a, a, a happier life or a more secure or uh, uh, less sacrificial life with the Holy Spirit, things that are 
or that you have judged in the past just start to disappear. Instead of you having to engage every ounce of your head with, oh God, now this is going on, now what? Um, and and that's, that's been, yeah. I think that's, to me, that's been the most interesting, beneficial thing in the course that's different from anything else that I've ever tried. Correct. Right. Marian, yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that, um, and I've been on a hundred thousand diets in my life. Um, you really have to be careful and, and notice where you're coming from. Yeah. Um, when I'm coming from ego, whatever I'm trying to fix is not going to get fixed. It just doesn't work. And probably for like the last month, my eating habits have changed quite a lot and I'm not doing it. Right. It's just happening. I'm, I'm watching this and I'm like, wow, you're, you're, and it, and it would be what the world would consider healthy. Although, you know, I'm probably never going to stop eating chocolate. <laughs> um, but Yes, there's been a definite shift. And I, I didn't sit down and think, well, this is the way I'm going to start eating now right. because this is healthier or blah, 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 whatever. It's just happening. Yep. And it's, I'm surprised. I'm surprised about it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a miracle. Yes, exactly. And <laughs> that's how this works. And I know I showed last week or the week before, you know, if this is a um, spoke of a tire and, you know, you might be working on some little issue with your neighbor or your, your kid or whatever. Well, when you work on that issue, literally all issues start to heal. Okay totally unbeknownst to us because they're really all connected in the core of the oneness aspect. So things like what Rose was talking about of all of a sudden, I just started eating better. I didn't put myself on a diet or whatever compared to all those years I spent on a diet trying to figure it out. Things just start to, to come together and healing begins to occur because you're focusing in on um, where the cause is or where the core is. And it just starts to snowball throughout your life experiences. And, and be, be very aware too. It's, it's again, you know, cause I could get caught up in that. It's yeah. not about the food. Yes. It's about how I'm judging the food. Right. Am I judging it as good or bad? Yeah. You know, right now I, there's very little that I judge as being bad food. I'll pretty much eat anything, but I'm just finding myself eating more of a lighter uh, way of eating. And I, again, it's just what I'm eating right now. That could change. Sure. Well, it's like what you always say, Marianne, that it's, you, you find yourself where you're at. So the way you're going to get to the lighter eating or whatever the Holy Spirit would, you know, would have you do right. is to go through whatever you have to go through. But it's just, it's just to have this as a, this is a totally different option to hammering your, banging your head up against the wall about things. It's just a yeah. totally different option. And that's what's so remarkable about it. And that's, that's my point too, is that it's not, it's not something I'm doing. Yes. It, it, you know, this course is, help, is so helpful in, in making me aware when I think I'm doing something or I'm trying to take control of something, that's a huge red flag now. You know, oop, wait a minute, hold on. I think I'm, I'm changing. I think something needs to get me fixed here. Um, that's, that to me, that's, that's what I need. That's where my attention goes. Yes, yes. Well, and the, and the deal is that as you keep, dropping your literally dropping your investment in the ego you're choosing for the holy spirit and this is this is what's growing this is where you're putting your coins in your bank and it's growing and you're not putting it over here so that's diminishing and then all of a sudden things just start to unfold in your world and you go well i didn't even ask for help with that and it just is a result of your continuing to invest in what you want now 
And, it's, and uh, I don't know if this has been mentioned or not, um, Marianne, but what Ken says in the little workshop that he did about eating with yeah. the, the three woman panel, he said, you ask yourself who you're sitting down to eat with. Yeah. You know, are you sitting down with the ego or are you sitting down with the Holy Spirit? And, you know, that's just taking what the Course tells us to apply in every situation and uh, applying it to, to food. You know, what, what am I doing now? Who am I with right now? Who's my teacher? Amen. And that would be true across the board, whether we're talking about food or anything else. Right. Who am I sitting with? Am I sitting with the crucifixion or am I sitting with the resurrection? You know, what, what is important to me? And if I'm spending all my time and effort and energy focused on crucifixion, I'm going to get the results of more crucifixion in my world. In well, some form Mary, Mary, yes. yes, Bob. Well, that if you're on a diet, if you're going to go on a diet, you're making a deal. Absolutely. Without a deal. There's no, 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 no two ways about it. You know? Correct. I'll yes. eat this yes. if I lose a weight. You yes. just think if you ate that and you didn't lose a weight, you think you'd yes. stop eating that. Exactly. Yes. So it's a deal. It's a bargain, absolutely. And, right. and that's why, as Rose was saying, she's not focusing in on a diet. She's focusing on, on healing. Right. And the result yeah. that kind of is just showing up for at this particular time right. is right. those issues are starting to diminish. And that I would also like to mention, uh, I have a hard time and sometimes you go off and I cannot talk. So, so yeah. I have to call Pat and I she told me uh, uh, how, uh, uh, how to do it. So, uh, so what I wanted to say is you can be in the ego and make a different choice and have a happier ego yes. than if you didn't make the proper choice. Yes. So, 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 so there's good and bad or, 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 or the <laughs> good is not quite as bad. You know, yes. if you yes. make the right choice while you're in the ego. That is correct. And that's one of the sneaky things about this program, because I can manipulate the world to have what I would call a, a more successful ending, but right. not be over here. Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, a couple more concepts, and then we'll read something from the... Just, just one second, Marianne. Yes, go ahead, Jason. Um, what you were just talking about was people who are uh, using, like, the law of attraction and stuff like that to bring things into their life. Is that what you're talking about? Well, that, that is certainly correct. <laughs> yes, yes, because I can make, a, you know, my world better, but I haven't transcended my world. And that can actually be a motivation to stay longer in the world because now I've got it figured out how it works a little bit better for me. And so I, you're really just making a, a happy, uh, another happy crucifixion. There you go. Yes, yes. And, you know, I'm not saying people shouldn't attempt to do that because you may, may attempt to do that and eventually it will falter too and then you'll dig deeper for an answer that goes beyond that. So, you know, I'm not saying, you know, just like you're going on the diet. Yeah. Nothing yeah. wrong with going on a diet. Just realize if I'm, or, or any healing, even it doesn't have to be a diet. If I'm looking for healing and I'm not looking for healing in my mind, I might get a physical healing. But if I really want a healed mind I have to go deeper and be very aware we're still very you know stuck in the you know I'm gonna fix my body and last longer and I'll be happy but if we're really honest you know most people that have ever let's say lost 20 pounds you still hate yourself right. you that you're not gonna find you're right? not gonna find you're not gonna find that peace in the ego absolutely only right. gonna be with the Holy Spirit yeah. You can find a little bit, you yeah. know, manipulating, Absolutely. like you said. You know. Yeah, yes, definitely. Okay, so I'm going to go to the concept of sin, because as we know in the conventional concept of Jesus dying on the cross, he died for our sins, okay? Now, this is where the Course has a slightly different flip to it, and the flip is 
the guiltless or God's son is guiltless and sin does not exist. Okay, so if from the perspective of the Course, sin doesn't exist, how could Jesus die on the cross for our sins? And here's another section where, and it's actually in the introduction at the very beginning where it says what, what it says, so still, excuse me, since love is all there is, sin in the sight of the Holy Spirit is a mistake to be corrected rather than an evil to be punished. So the Course has a total different lens of which to look at the concept of sin. Sin was simply a mistake. We made the mistake of choosing for the ego, and we need to come back to do what the truth is. We don't need somebody to die on a cross to do this. We don't need to suffer and be in more pain ourselves. We simply recognize I've chosen the opposite of truth and I can ask to see this differently. Or even just looking at the results of what that choice has brought me if, and to see that that's really not what I thought I was going to get. See, we thought we were going to choose to separate and we were going to take God's love and everything else with us. And now we were going to be on the throne and all would be good in the world. The only problem is when we, you know, got on the throne, we lost all the gifts that God had for us. And may I say, why don't you go in there? Um, we didn't really lose any of these. We just covered them over by the belief system of separation. And so as long as we believe in separation, we don't have access to what we really are. And the only way we can have access to it is to relinquish our identification with the separation. So very big, important concept within the context of the Course. Sin does not exist. All right, so then we also know the concept of Jesus dying on the cross for our yes, sin. Marianne, yes, go ahead. About, about sin? Yes. Um, people talk about sin and sins. Yes. Are there really any sins? Or no. is, it just, is it just sin? Well, I mean, I guess within the context of the world, I could do something which I thought was bad today, and I'd call that a sin, and then i do another one, and I would ca call those my sins. But the Course would say there really is no sin, because it's simply, you made a mistake, because everything, literally everything comes from this choice. No matter how the puppet in the world acts, it's coming from this belief system, as long as we're identified with this, this thought system. And the and course that's, that's say, the belief system. That's the belief system that we separated from God. That's the belief system we separated that's, from God. That's and synonymous that believe, with sin. And what? That's synonymous with sin. That is synonymous with sin according to the ego. And the course would okay. say, it didn't happen. It's not real. You just believe it's real. So nothing happened. There is no sin. And come back home. But to the degree that we accept this as our reality, we will live as an effect of that within the time and space world area because that's in place. And the Course is saying, we're going to look at this differently, you see, because sin would represent you could never come back home. This means you think you did something wrong, it didn't really happen, and you can come home anytime you want to. Well, the Christian idea of sin is there's like seven deadly sins and then there are minor sins and there are all kinds of different sins that yep. are affronts against God. We don't really have that in the course. One problem, one solution. Okay. Yeah. Problem is we believe we separated. The solution is no, we didn't. But then it requires me coming to a place where I accept that I'm love. Not that God doesn't accept that I'm love. Any attachment or strings that I hold of I'm not worthy, I'm not love, I'm not you name it, which all of us harbor in umpteen ways, is all saying I don't believe that he totally just loves me.
All right, so then the final one that I just want to hit on, and we will go through and go deeper into some of these ideas as we go along in the next couple of weeks. But this one is, no one can die for your sins. Now we know the story is Jesus died for our sins. And Jesus says, and this is on page 411, paragraph seven, if anybody cares, I am made welcome in the state of grace, which means you have lost forgiven me. And I'll talk about this line by line a little bit. For I became the symbol of your sin, and so I had to die instead of you. To the ego, sin means death, so atonement is achieved through murder. Salvation is looked upon as a way by which the Son of God was killed instead of you. Yet would I offer you my body, you whom I love, knowing its littleness? Or would I teach that bodies cannot keep us apart? Mine was of no greater value than yours, not better means for communication of salvation, but not its source. No one can die for anyone, and death does not atone for sin. But you can live to show it is not real. So Jesus is again, trying to help us look at this whole concept from a different lens, a different viewpoint. So what he's saying is, I made welcome in the state of grace, which means you have lost, last forgiven me. So why would I need to forgive Jesus? Good question. Well, let's take this down for a second. Um, you know, from the way this is all set up, I blame my brother due to my projection into the world of my guilt, sin, and fear, I blame my brother for being the person who perpetuates my innocent vic victimhood. So when it says, I forgive my brother, what I'm doing is recognize that what I did to my brother was what I set up. So it doesn't really have anything to do with what he's doing. It has to do with the fact that I set it up. So when the Course talks about forgiveness, it means I forgive my brother for what he didn't do. It was for what I set up via this choice. So when it talks about we have finally forgiven Jesus, well, we could put Jesus here as this image instead of a you. I don't, I'm no longer an innocent victim of Jesus because I see Jesus as I look at Jesus when I'm choosing to look through the ego as an innocent victim. When I step over here, the belief in innocent victim doesn't live there any longer. It's gone. And so when he says, I, you've last forgiven me, it's because you've lined up with what is true. For I became the symbol of your sin and so had to die instead of you. Well, you know, I don't know about the rest of you, but I can remember on a subtle level as a child, being brought up Catholic, um, you're kind of thinking, well, you know, if that happened to his favorite son, well, what the heck's gonna happen to me, you know? There was always that internal deal going on of something's not too good here. You know, if you're good, you're gonna, you're gonna get it. All right, so he died instead of us. Well, that's just not something that's gonna happen. To the ego, sin means death. And again, we were in eternity. When we chose for separation, we chose for the opposite of eternity. The opposite of eternity, uh, I don't see death over here, but one of the results is death. We now believe in a beginning and an ending. We believe we killed off God in order to be here. So death became a cornerstone of our belief system in separation. So when it says to the ego, sin means death. I'm going to die. We all know the whole concept of death within, within this world. We, every single person in this world is going to die because this is a world of birth and death. And the opposition or the opposite of that is eternity. We bought a package that had death in it. All right. So to the ego, sin means death. And so atonement is achieved through murder. So again, this whole thought system is wrapped around in the total opposite of what truth is. So what would be the question. answer here? Death would be here. Yes. Um, so I'm not 
yes, I'm going to die. My body's going to die. Yes. But, but I'm not. Correct. All right. I just want to be yeah. sure I got that right. Yes. Okay. Correct. And okay. again, it comes, you know, what am I identified with? If I'm identified with my body, I'm going to feel suffering of the loss of my body. But if I'm aligned with my truth of who I am, what happens to my body would be like taking a coat off when it's, you know, it's warm outside. No big deal. But to the degree we identify with our body being who we are, it will feel like it's a threat. And for most of us, it would certainly be considered a threat. Everything in this world dies. Exactly, because yeah. it's, a, it's a world of death. Right, and including this world, when, when, when everybody changes their mind and goes back to God as one. Correct. There will be no value to it any longer. Right. All right, so salvation is looked upon as a way by which the Son of God was killed instead of you. So we got salvation because Jesus died on the cross for us. And the whole focal point with that story was the crucifixion. Poor little Jesus was an innocent victim. We all could relate immensely to that because we all play the part of an innocent victim as well. And Jesus is saying to us here, yet would I offer you my body, you whom I love, knowing its littleness? Well, he knows the body's nothing. We don't know the body's nothing. And why would he offer his body when the story was to show us that it's our mind that's important? Or would I teach that bodies cannot keep us apart? So in other words, if we're aligned in our mind, and again, when Jesus chose to align over here, there's, a, there's you know, places in the Course where it says, we came with him. In his mind, we came with him because he was aligned with oneness, and in oneness, all of us are together. We, because we each individually have part, you know, these two parts of our mind, have to make that choice on our own. And when we do, we will then align with him in a place of an experience where we will see everybody else is healed as well. My body was of no greater value than yours. Not, no better means for communication of salvation, but its source. So in other words, the only answer to <clears throat> being uh, stuck in the body, I guess you could say, is to align with your source, which knows that the body is not who you are. I would also <laughs> like to say the sure. metaphor of uh, the body, and it's like taking a coat off. Yes. Oh yeah, well that's like peeling my skin off. That it doesn't quite go that easy, you know, taking the coat off. Oh, yes. I just want to say that doesn't sure. stick with me. <laughs> and and I understand, and that would be true for all of us, but that's because we still believe we're the hero of the dream of our main, and I'm the main character, and my body is important and it's valuable. Yeah. And, you know, that's where we all find ourselves. Yeah. And we can't pretend that that's not true at this point. But literally, each time we are willing to have the little willingness and drop this and connect with this, we are becoming more aligned with that understanding of who we really are. And this is becoming less and less solid for us and i think that old age helps you because mm -hmm. as you get older and older and more stuff doesn't work and then you you pretty much get into the idea that oh i must not be this body because look look what it's doing <laughs> right 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 but i've known people that were very old that clung to their body quite significantly still and i really believe in my you know process of doing the course my attachment to my body is definitely lessening. I mean, it's still there, don't get me wrong, yeah. but yeah. compared to where it was before, there's definitely a major shift. Yeah. Uh, but is what my problem is, is that I think that I am the ego and, and, and I have to give up the ego to find out what the, what the right mind is. And, and I, have, I wanna keep what I know or think I know is true. You're asking me to give that up is saying this other is true and I really don't know it's true. You're asking me to have faith and I don't have that faith to give up the ego to go to the other place to see if that's real. 
people. And those are all correct statements, Bob, all of which all of us struggle with, you know, every day. Right. So, okay. uh, so it's easy to say going back and forth and back and forth, but you have to give the whole ego up. Well, something new. Something new. <laughs> a little one bite at a time, maybe, huh? Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I think that's why Jesus talks about the idea of the little willingness. Every time you ask to see it through his eyes instead of what the ego has set up, you are actually putting the, you know, the coins in that bank account. And this is becoming more solid. And every time you're doing that, you're not putting it in here and you're not making this as solid. And we have put it in here since the Big Bang. Which one of these do you think is going to run the show? This one. Because we've given it the power to do so. But now we have an understanding of another way that we can start to invest in what we really want now. But then, but well, then, just, but then again, I don't know if, if my peace is coming from when I make the choice for the Holy Spirit or if I'm choosing the peace of the ego. Oh. Well, well, as I understand, right, as I understand it, Bob, in my experience, the universe will keep showing me until I get it completely. <laughs> I don't. Well, you just keep. You just get curious. You got more curious about what's going on in the. In the I mean, you already. You could see the cru crucifixions like laid out for you. The nails go in, and you, then you you die. But the but to get more curious about what the resurrection really is is right. is a step in the right direction and it, you don't have to you know it's, you don't have to make it rocket science you just uh kind of slip into it and ask you know well if that's if there is a resurrection well wh how did that occur and and what does that really mean and i just you know having gone through years of catholic school and all to get to the bottom of it was like you just thought well it's something much better than i could ever do but now it's something that is 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 uh um you know brought up for me to think about into maybe uh, how could i do that is becomes the question rather than mm -hmm. oh poor jesus you know i never want to do that it's it's what can i how can i do that yes but it's, i don't know if that's true true or not well you won't know unless you ask or, the question or, if you or, and if you don't or, or you can only is, ask it if you feel like it right i mean if you if you think it's something if it occurs to you to ask the question then you're okay. If it doesn't, then you'll be okay until it occurs to you. And then you'll ask the question. Or or not. <laughs> Go ahead, Sally. Uh, another quotation, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, you will see your own resurrection. That's a quote. Yep. And I'm just tying yeah. it into this, but I can't yeah. explain anymore. Right, right. And another thing that happens as we keep asking, literally, who you were when you left is not who you are when you come back. And as you keep feeding into this or choosing for this, this becomes less tolerable. And your desire to find out what this is starts to become more of a draw. Mm -hmm. And as you keep asking for healing, the reflections of that healing begin to occur in your life, which also you know, stimulate your desire to choose more frequently. But also, but also if I make the right choices when I'm in the ego and make better ego choices, that makes my life better also. <laughs> you, you win, Bob, you, you win. <laughs> but as a result of these, the results of the choice for healing will unfold in a way that Marianne or Bob are not in charge. It will reflect something that goes beyond you, and that will continue to draw you forth as well. So Marianne, and, you know, how, that, how, how does death equal salvation to the ego? Well, because the, the ego is the total opposite of what the Holy Spirit is. And death is like, yay, we got death, because we, you know, this is my gift to myself, is death. Yeah, but you're born again and die again and born again and die again. You, right. You but for most of us, we're so attached to our body. We're just thinking about my body, this little body called me. But even, even your, quote, soul is part of the ego, right? 
so, correct because there's really just oneness. So you, if you think about reincarnation, we die again all, all the time. I mean, we, so it's, exactly. so how does that yeah, you know signify that. salvation to the ego? Salvation to the ego is survival of the ego. Right. Yeah. And it just it keeps going on. It's like a, the hamster wheel. It exactly. just keeps going. Exactly. Yeah, it doesn't ever enter into what the Holy Spirit wants or what the Holy Spirit has to offer. It never enters that. Yes. And it's, I can do something God can't do. Yes, ma'am. I can do. Uh, yes, I can do it. Right. I know. So, Isn't that a great accomplishment, God? Yeah. I can do <laughs> 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 oh. <Yes. laughs> All right. So again, no one can die for anyone, and death does not atone for sin. And again, the reason I'm bringing this out is to help us to look at the lens of the story of crucifixion and resurrection and realize the course is leading us in a new direction. And what we thought was the story according to the course is very different. And then he goes on to say, but you can live to show it's not real. And how would we live to show it's not real is to follow the the offerings that Jesus has. And whenever somebody attacks me and I ask for healing and ask to see it through the lens of, of the Holy Spirit and I don't attack my brother back, I'm living what he said. And that's how we would live through and show that he is alive in us. Okay. All right, we are going to go to chapter 20 on text 425. And we're going to start with paragraph one. All right, so this chapter is called The Vision of Holiness. And this is the section called Holy Week. This is Palm Sunday, the celebration of victory and the acceptance of truth. Let us not spend this week brooding on the crucifixion of God's Son, but happily on the celebration of his release. For Easter is a sign of peace, not pain. A slain Christ has no meaning, but a risen Christ becomes the symbol of the Son of God's forgiveness on himself the sign he looks upon himself as healed and whole. So again, Palm Sunday is the, the beginning of the Holy Week. So hope the Palm Sunday is the celebration of victory and acceptance of truth. We're not going to linger in the crucifixion anymore. We, we did enough of that. It's time for us to work on understanding and completely living what the resurrection is about. Let us not spend this holy week brooding on the crucifixion of God's son, but happily on the celebration of his release. And again, you know, everybody in the room has had different experiences from their history of how you looked at Easter. Um, so we're all going to have different experiences around that. But when I was brought up, you know, you did, you went through the stations of the cross every Friday. And in my church, we did them on Wednesday too, because we wanted to make sure we all suffered and had pain. And that's not the purpose from the perspective of the course. We want to understand who we are as oneness, not as separation. Go ahead, Sal. So this really does not coincide with being Catholic <laughs> or going to Mass. I mean, Mass is at least for me a, an outward visual thing. You get to go to church, you might see somebody, although you don't pretty much talk. But like, um, you're part of a group, you're standing up, genuflecting and everything, and that feels good. But it, but it does not uh, jibe with the course at all. Nope. 
so I have to give it up, but I refuse to give it up. Uh, you know, Sally, I mean, I'm, I, as I said, I was brought up Catholic, and when I started the course, I was still probably actively a Catholic, and there was no way I ever thought I would leave the Catholic Church or eventually leave church altogether. Not even in my nothing. But as I kept working on the course and this started to make more sense there was this just fell away I, um, stop doing it it happened it just happened well i still go but i don't uh go to communion i don't you know do confession and all that stuff but um i don't know i guess i get something out of just going oh and there's always a nice little sermon too usually um so I don't know. I think I've got one foot in the course and one foot over in this Catholic stuff. Yep. That's, That's, that makes perfect sense to me. I, why leave something if, why fix something if it ain't broken? You yeah. know, the, the, there's a lot of things to be offered. The comfort of, yeah. of what's familiar, uh, my family. I mean, I didn't really give up um, Catholicism. Um, it dropped me. Yeah. In a sense, yes. uh, I still, you know, if my family would go, I would go because, it, you know, it's like a tradition. Yeah. Um, and I, I guess I haven't had an argument with it. That's it. I have never had an argument with anybody in the Catholic Church. I just, uh, it kind of wore off. And then all the pomp and circumstance became, uh, because, I, because I went through so much of it as a child, you know, like, like Marianne said, well, Fridays and Wednesdays too, and, you know, Holy Saturdays, and there were uh, um, all kinds of, kinds of uh, uh, retreats and things during the year. You know, I really went through, ran the gamut of all these ritualistic things that were supposedly going to save me. I mean, that was the whole purpose, and um, they didn't. And, well, and I, I, I wasn't mad at anybody. I just didn't get, I didn't get what I went there for. Well, <laughs> I guess I yeah. felt like I didn't get what I paid for. Okay. I go and what I do is I think of God knowing here we are, all these people doing this because we want to have some relationship with God, whatever it is. Yep. Yep. And it's like, yeah, um, that's, that's so perfect. I, pardon? What? That's, that's perfect. That's, yeah. Yeah. you know, that's where you are. And yeah, that's, right. that's very important. I mean, some people don't even, you know, well, some people they don't even really, uh, I, I guess my question was always about people that don't go to church at all, but I'm learning about that too. And because it doesn't matter. A, yeah, right. Right. And the course, as we said, as Marianne has said earlier, the course is not asking us to give anything up. Again, that's me, ego, trying to do something. Right, and that would you know, be a form of um, sacrifice. Just keep doing what you're doing. Yep. You know? Ken was talking about uh, Mother Teresa, and you know, his uh, real, you know, his interview with her and her relationship yep. with her, yep. and uh, you know, she, he could see that while their their form was different, the content of what was being communicated in the course and what she was communicating was essentially the same. Exactly. Yeah, you you know, all paths lead to God, as as they say. So it doesn't, you know, it doesn't really matter. And and it's not about the course is not about sacrifice. It's not about giving anything up. Jason, who was that that you were speaking of? Oh, Ken Wapnick. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I read all his his life history and everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's good. Thank you for bringing that up. And and to to Sally's point, I think it's very important. We need to take ourselves exactly where we are. You know, right. for you to stop going to church would be a sacrifice. <laughs> it wouldn't be who you are. Yeah, right. So continue to do that. But I think it's also beautiful that you're getting the understanding. This and this aren't the same. Right, right. And they're kind of like <laughs> more like this. And in regard to, you know, you have one foot in each world, I guess. Yeah. Think about this this being a railroad track, but instead of the tracks being parallel, they're going like this. Yeah, so, and so and I we, think it's God's problem to figure out where the hell I'm going, excuse the metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. pretty Sally's deal. As the okay. Yeah, you're right. It's really mine. Okay. <laughs> 
Well, I mean, I when, when you say, when, when anyone says, help me, help me God, what they mean is that they don't know how, how it's going to work. And that makes perfect sense. So if you're going to places, you know, you're just doing what you're doing. You don't know how it's going to work. And then God will come in and help you, show you. Mm-hmm. If you ask. The God yeah. within. Okay, so line three, paragraph one. For Easter is a sign of peace, not pain. And again, how much focus on my life, how much focus on Easter has to do with pain versus peace. You know, what am I putting all my energy on a daily basis to? And if we really got every time I'm attached to attack, guilt, sin, and fear, you know, we're different, blah, 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 my attachment to my body, I'm identifying with the crucifixion. Yeah. And I'm ordering, this is what I want. Thank you very much. Well, we didn't get that before. We didn't understand that we're literally self-perpetuating that which we say we don't want. And this is just trying to bring to the surface of what we're really up to. All right, the slain Christ has no meaning. Thank goodness. (laughs) But a risen Christ becomes the symbol of the Son of God's forgiveness on himself the sign he looks upon himself as healed and whole. So kind of like what Andrea was saying, the question becomes, do I want to know who I am as God created me? Bottom line, do I want to know myself as I see me or as he sees me? And, you know, the idea of the little willingness when do we use that? Usually when we're not very comfortable. And eventually we start to use that more and more frequently because we start to realize choosing to connect is working out better than my way of doing it. So paragraph two, this week begins with palms and ends with lilies. The white and holy sign, the son of God is innocent. Let no dark sign of crucifixion intervene between the journey and its purpose, between the acceptance of the truth and its expression. This week we celebrate life, not death, and we honor the perfect purity, the Son of God, and not his sins. Offer your brother the gift of lilies, not the crown of thorns, the gift of love, not the gift of fear. Stand beside your brother, thorns in one hand, lilies in the other, uncertain which to give. Join now with me and throw away the thorns, offering the lilies to replace them. This Easter, I would have the gift of your forgiveness offered by you to me and returned by me to you. We cannot be united in crucifixion and in death. Nor can the resurrection be complete until your forgiveness rests on Christ along with mine. All right, so this week begins with palms and ends with lilies. The white and holy sign, the Son of God, is innocent. And actually, for those of you that got the Um, definition that I sent, the definition of lilies is the coarsest symbol of forgiveness and innocence of God's, innocence of God's son. It is the gift of forgiveness that we offer each other in contrast to the ego's gifts of thorns. So again, we're offering the gift of lilies or we're offering the gift of thorns. So we're either nailing our brother to the cross when we identify in any way, shape, or form with the separated part of ourselves, or we're offering lilies of forgiveness when we step out of our mode of the way we normally look and think of things. So let no dark sign of crucifixion interfere between the journey and the purpose between the acceptance of the truth and its expression. 
And what this literally means is if I hold grievances towards myself, towards my brother, I'm saying, number one, I know, I'm right, I've got the answer, Holy Spirit, stay away, I don't need you. And I'm putting myself on the cross and my brother on the cross, and this is going to remain distant for me. And how's that working for you? Well, and, and that's the question right there, how's that working for me? And when I really connect the dots of this is what I'm getting as I continue to perpetuate the ego, and this will be what I will get when I start to choose for the Holy Spirit. What result do I want? But before, I didn't know that. I thought I was an innocent victim. All I could do was attack my brother to have any justification of anything working out in my world. No brainer. Kill or be killed. Dualistic world. And now we're giving another option, another possibility. All right. So this week we celebrate life, not death. And, you know, just the idea of the choice of life and death. Well, if, as you know from this chart, choosing for the ego resulted in the belief in death. We believe we killed off God to exist in duality. This is a, a thought system based on the concept of death. It's inbred in our very blood. That's how deeply seated it is. Only we weren't aware of it. And this is trying to help us understand how deeply seated this thought system is and what it really represents. So death and time are re related quite a bit here then. And form. And the, form. The, the idea that something has a finite existence or even in reincarnation, it has a finite existence and then it has another finite existence. Yes. But Absolutely. that's time related, right? Well, yes, but time is the ego. Time, world, and space live here. Right. That's the result of here. And the, the miracle is defined as a moment of time and space where we don't exist. Yeah, by that time, you don't care about anything else. No. Yeah. Eventually, that is exactly correct. I mean, by that time, it doesn't matter if you're who gets reincarnated or if that even happens. Because when you're in, in with the Holy Spirit, and when you're in the in the the, right. the Holy Instant, you don't have any yearning for any of those things. You become right. one with the Holy Spirit, and that's right. and that's the whole answer. Like that, to me, that's the whole answer. And when you get that answer, you're not going to ask any more questions much at that time. But you will Definitely. later on, maybe. But. And, and just think about the idea of, you know, reincarnation is there's a me and I'm going to continue on to another, you know, step or another party or whatever you want to call it, but there's still a me. And of course, we would prefer to believe in reincarnation if I identify with my body being a value. And, you know, again, most of us still do. So, you know, just become aware that's where I'm still playing. But the body in that case is the soul. Right, in that case, correct. Not the, not the physical yeah. body, but right, the right, soul. Right. Yes, yeah. And, you know, the whole idea of oneness is there's nothing else but one. There is no Jason, Mary, and a soul, a body, or a memory, or any of those things. Yeah. That's not part of it any longer. And you don't you don't miss it when you're in the holy instant. You don't you you're like wow I wow I got got rid of that one. Look at that. You know that that puts you back in the ego, of course. But you don't miss it. You don't you're not going to have that if you're in oneness, right? You're going to be at total peace. Yes. And and the whole idea of anything that has to do with this is just gone. Yeah. What value would that have if I know who I am? I mean, between that and the Catholic Church, I, I got to say, I, I think I got a good thing going. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> All right. Offer your brothers the gift of lilies, not 
the crown of thorns. Now see, the trick of that is we don't even really get that we've been offering our brother the crown of thorns. And when we offer it to him, we're offering it to ourselves. That's been totally oblivious to us. I thought he was an idiot and I have to attack him because he, you know, did something to me. And that's a no-brainer. That's what you do on planet Earth. All done. Got some else to do. But when you start to realize, ooh, wait a minute here. When I crucify my brother, since my brother is me, I'm crucifying myself as well. And I'm, when I'm in that space, I eliminate the possibility of connecting with what is true. All right, so do, 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 do. all right, so offer your brother the gift of lilies, not the crown of thorns, the gift of love, and not the gift of fear. And again, the reason why this continues to be perpetuated is because we believe in guilt, sin, and fear. This is what runs the show that brings this storyline. So if there is fear in my mind, which there would be if I'm aligned with the ego. The problem isn't anything that has to do with fear in the world. It has to do with fear in my mind that then gets projected in different forms in the world. So the healing is, oh, I'm identified with the thought of, of fear, guilt, and death. I want to find out your way of looking at this, dude, because mine's not working out too well. You stand beside your brother, thorns in one hand, lilies in the other, uncertain which to give. And why are we uncertain? Because we don't really totally accept this thought system yet. We don't really 100% believe that Jesus is really saying what he's saying here. I'm supposed to offer lilies to whatever my brother does to me? Really? You must be joking, dude. There has to be another way. It's not, I'm missing something here. Okay. And what I'm missing is how serious the, I'm going to say the problem, that doesn't really sound right, but we don't get how deeply seated we are in this thought system and what the result of choosing, accepting, and living this thought system bring us. We're not completely convinced of that yet. But as we keep walking forward, we will slowly catch that this is just not a good idea. And again, you know, I, don't, I didn't bring that, but you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had the two hands that were fighting when we couldn't see that the body was attached to both hands. We don't get that I'm punching myself every time I attack my brother. It feels like there's a he and there's a me, and I get him before he gets me. But in truth, if I punch him, I am punching me. Or hating him, or any of the other adjectives you can add to that. All right, so we're uncertain which to give. He's inviting us. Join now with me and throw away the thorns, offering the lilies to replace them. Well, be very aware we're not real thrilled about throwing our thorns away. That's gotten us a lot of what we thought we wanted. And, you know, we might think we're these really sweet, wonderful, nice people. But if you think anything other than love of your brother or yourself, you're not so sweet and lily white. You're really over here totally identified with this thought system and perpetuating this thought system. Join now with me and throw away the thorns offering the lilies to replace them. This Easter, I would have the gift of your forgiveness offered by you to me and returned by me to you. So what that basically means is when we align with truth, we will get truth back and the, the concept, again, of the idea of forgiving Jesus is that just like we projected into our brother the guilt, sin, and fear, literally Jesus was the first character that we projected our guilt, sin, and fear into. And he's not the problem. 
The belief in separation is the problem and why we see the brother as different than us. And again, there is an essence of us hating Jesus because he got it and I didn't get it. And I read earlier the idea of Jesus was telling us specifically, I am the same as you. The only thing is different is that I unequivocally know that what love is, you're still in the arena of, uh, I'm not sure I want to give my brother those lilies. I think I'll still give him the thorn. And again, we're the ones that are holding one or the other. And at this point, sometimes I'll probably hold one and then I'll throw the other one in there and I'll go back and forth many, many times until it really, really, really dawns on me. Thorns is not the answer. We cannot be united in crucifixion and in death. So the only place that we can access oneness is when we align with the Holy Spirit and let go of our attachment to the separation. Nor can the resurrection be complete until your forgiveness rests on Christ along with mine. And be very aware, and this kind of will go back to what Jason said about the, um, the secret and, and manifesting things and getting good things and the positive things in the world. You know, in this thought of separation, there are what we call the negative things and there's what we might call the positive things. But both of these things, no matter how positive the positive may be, is still part of the dream. And when we release the dream completely, that's when we'll realign with Jesus because he's outside of the dream. He's no longer playing in part of the dream. He can see the dream, but, oops, but he is no longer identified as part of the dream as we still are. So it's the complete relinquishment of the dream, not just making part of the dream a little bit nicer. Not that as an ego that doesn't feel good, and not that we would not even continue to do that, but understand that's not where this is leading us. Where this is leading us is the relinquishment of the dream so that we are part of the oneness. And then at that point, literally, Jesus wouldn't be a separate entity. He would be as part of the oneness. Paragraph number three. A week is short, short, and yet this holy week is the symbol of the whole journey the Son of God has undertaken. He started with the sign of victory, the promise of the resurrection already given him. Let him not wander into the temptation of crucifixion and delay him there. Help him to go in peace beyond it. And with the light of his own innocence, lighting his way to his redemption and release. Hold him not back with thorns and nails when his redemption is so near. But let the whiteness of your shiny gift of lilies speed him on his way to resurrection. All right, so the week is short, and this holy week is the symbol of the whole journey the Son of God has taken. And basically what this represents is that Jesus is offering us an understanding of what his journey was, and he's inviting us to follow in that journey. Now, his idea of a short week and our idea of the short week may look a lot different, you could say, because he's not enmeshed in the experience as we are, but the possibilities are at least now available. He started with the sign of victory, the promise of resurrection already given him. And Jesus is offering that to us. He's saying, here it is, here's the resurrection. Don't linger in the crucifixion. Come on over here. And we're still dabbling with the, with the uh, thorns and with the, with the nails because we're not convinced that this is the answer. Let him not wander into temptation of crucifixion and delay him there. Well, Jesus is 
offering to us, don't linger, excuse me, don't wander into temptation. Well, you know, the Lord's Prayer talked about wandering into temptation. Well, we didn't understand that literally the temptation he's talking about is our identification with our ego. It's so much bigger than I made a mistake or I did something wrong and I need to be forgiven. And as Jason said, the, the hierarchy of different sins. Well, the, the belief that I made a mistake and now that can be corrected is what Jesus is offering us. And he's inviting us not to get lost in the journey of the temptation. Help him to go in peace beyond it with the light of his own innocent lighting his way to his redemption and release. And basically what Jesus is leading to here is as we release our brother from attack, even though as an ego, I feel extremely, extremely, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, Justified. Justify, thank you. Justify to attack my brother back because he did me wrong. And in a world of kill or be killed, the answer to being killed is to do it back to them. That's the natural flow, the knee jerk response of living on planet Earth as a good little ego. Now, the beauty of this is when we stop the flow of this, we are now representing a new way. We've dropped our nails, we've dropped our thorns, and we're saying we're not doing this anymore. And it's not really any different than playing tug of war with a friend. And you decide, I'm done. And you let go of the rope. You've allowed the opportunity for your brother to see another way, because you're no longer doing this. You allow that mortar to fill in and take the spaces of connecting in oneness. Hold him back, excuse me, hold him not back with thorns and nails when his redemption is so near. So when we can represent God's love by dropping the nails and the thorns, we're offering a possibility that our brother may not have been aware of before. And there's a lovely place in the course where it says, basically, whichever one of the two of you is more healed has the opportunity to offer healing to the brother. Well, if my brother doesn't even know it's a possibility, who do you think has that opportunity? That would be me if I know a little bit more than my brother does. But again, we can't do this from a place of sacrifice. We need to do this because it really dawns on me that choosing for love is the best way to experience this situation. Until then, it really would be a sacrifice if you pretended you were walking over here versus being willing to completely drop your investment. But let the whiteness of your shining gift of the lilies speed him on his way to resurrection. So again, in the process of me choosing for healing, I am literally offering not just lilies to my brother, I'm literally, literally offering them to myself as well. And I mentioned earlier of the idea of the, the difference between manipulation of me doing something in the world to fix it versus choosing this way, where this becomes a win-win situation instead of a I win and they lose situation. So as we offer these gifts of lilies, we are really winning, and so is our brother. All right, we're going to go through four here. Easter is not the celebration of the cost of sin, but of its end. If you see glimpses of the face of Christ behind the veil, looking between the snow white petals of the lilies you have received and given as your gift, you will behold your brother's face and recognize it. It was a stranger and you took me in, not knowing who I was. 
Yet for your gift of lilies, you will know. In your forgiveness of this stranger, alien to you and yet your ancient friend, lies his release and your redemption with him. The time of Easter is a time of joy, not of mourning. Look on your risen friend and celebrate his holiness along with me. For Easter is the time of your salvation along with mine. I love this line. Easter is not the celebration of the cost of sin, but of the end, or of its end. Because again, there is no sin. We simply made a, 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 a mistake that can be forgiven. If it were sin, it could never ever be forgiven. So if you see glimpses of the face of Christ behind the veil, looking between the snow white petals of lilies you have received and given as your gift, you will behold your brother's face and recognize it. And I'm just gonna go on because we're close to the end. I was a stranger and you took me in not knowing who I was. And we know from the Bible that um, statement from Jesus, you know, feed the hungry and whatnot. When you're doing good for your brother, you're doing for me because what you do to the least of your brothers, you are doing for me. Not just for Jesus, not just for your brother, but for yourself because we're all one and we will see each other through this lens or we will see each other through this lens, depending on if we offer thorns or if we offer lilies. Yet for your gift of lilies, you will know. And we will know because we will know that we are identified with our truth. In your forgiveness of this stranger, alien to you and yet your ancient friend, lies his release and your redemption with him. And the course talks about the holiest of places is when an ancient enemy turns into a present love or something to that effect. I'm not giving the absolute quote, but we have made our brother the bad guy so that we could pull off the belief in this, this thought system and still remain an innocent victim. And when we're ready to relinquish that, to find out who I am and who my brother is, that's when I can find out that we are the same and that we are not different. The time of Easter is a time of joy and not of mourning. And again, the focus on, is on resurrection, not on crucifixion. Look on your risen friend and celebrate his holiness along with me. For Easter is the time of your salvation along with mine. And again, a win-win situation instead of the opposite, which we have played with and been involved in since the Big Bang. It's time for us to come to a new way of being. And what does that require? It requires me making a different choice. And if I'm waiting for my brother to do something different so that I would be okay, I've got a long wait. And it can happen now. Okay, that's it for today. We're going to do our usual. I'll mute everyone, we'll say our prayer, and if you want to stay on and talk, you can. Take a nice big deep breath and let it all go. Forgive us our illusions, Father, and help us to accept our true relationship with you in which there are no illusions and where none can ever enter. Our holiness is yours. What can there be in us that needs forgiveness when yours is perfect? The sleep of forgetfulness is only the unwillingness to remember your forgiveness and your love. Let us not wander into temptation, 
for the temptation of the Son of God is not your will. And let us receive only what you have given and accept but this into the minds which you created and which you love. Amen. All right, so.